Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn a little bit more about our exciting new product, the Zip Pro. Um, I'm going to give it just a few minutes, uh, probably one more minute to allow all of our participants to join. Uh, while we're doing that, I wanted to cover just a few housekeeping items. Uh, the first is um, at the bottom left of your screen, you'll see a box for Q&A. That's our questions and answers. Uh, throughout the presentation, feel free to enter in a, a question. Um, certainly, uh, if you have anything that needs to be answered immediately, we'll do that. If not, we'll hold that for the end and go through those at that time. If you're encountering any technical difficulties with um, audio, visuals, anything like that, uh, please enter that directly into the webinar chat. That'll go directly to uh, me, the host, and our other panelists, and I'll try to help you resolve that um, during the presentation so that we can get that corrected quite quickly for you. All righty. And uh, Mike, if you go ahead and move it to the next slide. All right, so just some quick introductions as we're getting started. Uh, my name is Lewis Sims. I'm the head of industrial product marketing at Nexa 3D, and I'll be your host today for the webinar. Uh, joining us uh, and presenting with us today are Mike Curry, who is our chief product officer, and he'll be reviewing um, all about the zip uh, today. And then we'll be wrapping up uh, with a quick conversation with Glenn Mason, who is the manager of advanced innovation and industrialization at Wilson Sporting Goods. Uh, Glenn is a uh, Nexa 3D super user. He was part of our beta testing program with Zip Pro and has a lot of experience utilizing this uh, for some really demanding applications and particularly freeform injection molding uh, with our X-Mold material. Um, so he'll have a lot of great feedback. Um, certainly someone, if you're considering the Zip, uh, as you're looking through your Q&As, feel free to share that. Um, and are feel free to ask those questions and, and we'll be sure to address those uh, with Glenn uh, during the Q&A. Um, we already have one question coming in, so I'll go ahead and answer that for you. Uh, slides will be uh, made available uh, via on-demand viewing uh, after this, so you can share this presentation with anyone who wasn't able to make it today. Um, Mike, next slide. All right, so here's today's agenda. Uh, first, we're going to do a very brief overview of Nexa 3D and our LSPC technology. And we just want to make sure that you kind of understand exactly how our technology works um, so that as we get a little bit further into the, the product, um, hopefully that leaves a lot of questions answered for you um, and you'll be able to understand more about how the uh, printer operates and its capabilities. Um, then Mike's going to kind of address um, the, this uh, uh, very important question, and that is, can AM replace traditional manufacturing? And he's got a really unique perspective on that and some great examples. Uh, then we're going to introduce the Zip Pro and kind of talk through uh, this product, its features, its benefits, and um, certainly how you could leverage the Zip Pro in your business. Um, we'll see how you can achieve a new level of productivity with our ultra-fast Zip Pro printer that is all focused about high-throughput 3D printing. That'll include uh, the associated workflows, as well as some technical specifications um, about the printer itself. And then we'll turn it over to Glenn, who will speak about his own experience with the Zip Pro to date. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Okay, thank you, Lewis. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining the call. Uh, I'm really excited to announce and talk about the Zip Pro. It's, it's an amazing printer. Uh, and there's a lot to cover, and so we're going to go pretty fast. And all means, you know, by all means, throw your questions in, and we'll try to keep as much time as we can at the end for uh, for questions. So Nexa 3D, we were founded in uh, 2016 by Avi Reichenthal, and uh, about three years later, just pre-pandemic, we released our first product, the NX NXE series, which was our our flagship industrial uh, 3D printer. Uh, we have over 100 employees, and we're located in, in sunny Ventura, California. Uh, also, very importantly, we manufacture all of our printers in, in Ventura as well. Uh, and over the past few years, we've been growing very quickly, adding reseller channels, <clears throat> building up a really big patent portfolio. And uh, we've actually uh, almost doubled our installs in just the past year worldwide. I'll talk a bit about that in a little while. Uh, 
And so what this is a lineup of where we were two weeks ago. And so our, our vision is to build a sustainable digital supply chain throughout our manufacturing. And so when we started the company, you know, to quote Steve Jobs, like our, our dent in the universe was to really make production ready additive manufacturing tools that you can scale up from prototyping and then move into, into mass manufacturing of products. And that was where the, the NXE 400 uh, came into play. Uh, last year, we introduced a few new products to, to continue that mission. On the far, far left, we uh, added the Zip desktop printer. We call it our industrial desktop, and that's that's not an oxymoron. It's been a great machine to help uh, distributed manufacturing. Then we have our NXC, uh, that's the tall one with the blue background, and then we have a number of our powder bed fusion systems, which we've been really investing in heavily in the past few years to further grow out our our plastic portfolio. So you could say that for the most part, when you think of Nexa 3D, we have a lot of plastic technologies, and we have them in both the resin side of uh, the house. And we also have them in the uh, powder side of the house. And for the this presentation, obviously, the Zip Pro is a, is a resin-based printer. So I want to first give a little bit of background on our technology and, and why we think it's going to help you scale. And then that'll lead into the Zip Pro. Okay, so for resin-based printing, uh, there are three generations that we, we've talked about. Uh, the first generation was the one that was invented by Chuck Hall back in the 1980s. And that's stereolithography. It's always hard to say. Uh, but that came in two forms, a, a right side up, and as you see depicted here, an upside down format. Uh, and what this means is you have a, a, a vat of liquid polymers, uh, sorry, uh, monomers and oligomers that you want to create into polymers. And you do that by shining a, a laser light onto the uh, liquid, re liquid resin, which then has photo, in photo initiators that polymerize your part. And so you, you basically slice up your part and then you draw that laser light, almost raster out where you want curing to happen. And then after each layer is cured, it lifts up and resets. And then the next layer is cured. Uh, this was the first generation, but by all means, it wasn't the fastest because you had to direct your laser over the entire area. Uh, the second generation, which really uh, improved speed and it pushed this product line towards production was the DLP concept. And this here, uh, came from the idea that Tex Instruments had about putting millions of small mirrors onto a, uh, you know, a, a, a silicon chip. And what happens here is you project a lamp source as opposed to a laser source onto this chip. And then that chip can project a full image of where you want to have curing. So instead of doing rastering, you can now image a full layer at a time. And this uh, allowed for very quick speed enhancements. And then the third generation where Nexa 3D plays is uh, what we call mast stereolithography or MSLA. And this is where you're replacing that lamp and that chip with a set of passive LED light sources and LCD masks to create that image. Uh, and so Nexa 3D has a, a, a variant of that, which we call our, our lubricant sublayer photo curing uh, technology, which allows us to then go even further and a further speed enhancement beyond where DLP was. So uh, this generous evolution of speed is probably the, the thing that is helping us create ultra fast printers and move into production and create lots and lots of parts. Uh, but there are also some other benefits that I'll just cover very quickly in this slide. Uh, in terms of the three generations, due to there is, if you're trying to make a lot of parts and have them all come out the same, uh, you're really, you wanna make sure that you present the same, same curing shape across your entire array. So uh, the MSLA product, because you're using a, a pixel defined by the LCD, uh, you have very uniform pixel size. Uh, earlier generations had issues with uh, projecting either a projection system where you have distortion or you have a, a laser uh, off-axis issue where you have a projected angle area, uh, projected angle differences. We mentioned printing speed, and then uh, also to think about in terms of what is the what defines the smallest thing you can actually cure or create in your part. Uh, for SLA, it would be basically limited to how small the laser you can have. Uh, for a DLP, it's basically uh, what your projected you know that little pixel on that chip is very tiny, obviously, but then it's it's sort of how far you project that, and that can be either very large or very small, based on based on your system you choose. And then the MSLA is based on that LCD pixel. So 
uh, this is where we're we're writing the you know the peace dividends of the of the of the screen wars and the you know the the resolutions that are obviously growing every day. Uh, in terms of scalability, you know we like to think that MSLA is, is very scalable because you're just adding larger LCD arrays or you're adding extra uh, pixels in the array. You don't have to add uh, what I would call more chunkier objects like adding an additional projector or adding additional laser. You can just scale out these small little atomic bits of LCD and LED to get uh, high levels of scalability. And then lastly, uh, you know, you can truly say that an MSLA printer has one moving axis. There's only the Z axis, which moves in these systems. Everything else is passive. So you get, uh, it's kind of very interesting that you get, you can create lots of complexity, but you will literally have very low complexity in terms of the number of axes moving, which is just one. So you can put a lot of effort into just that one axis to make sure that you get a great product. Okay, so the LSPC technology, it's a, it's a stack of those things I just talked about. You have your, your, your LED array, you have your, your collimating lenses, which take the LED array and instead of discretizing it as these little small LEDs, you have a, a flood of, of curing light. You have an imaging mask, which you then project your slice of your, each slice of your part that you're trying to make. And then you have your LSPC membrane, uh, which is in contact with your resin. Um, the our LSPC membrane is one of our, our patented technologies. Uh, it allows us to go uh, very quickly. And um, I'll talk about, about that in the next slide. And what it does is this whole stack, we've engineered this to go very, to go very quickly. Um, and so if you can imagine the Zip Pro taking one unit of time to build a particular set of parts, it might take our, a DLP machine two to three times as long or an SLA machine up to five to 10 times as long. So this is where this technology is gonna be suited best to put you in, in, in a position to be able to enter production. All right, so I wanted to talk about the LSC pro LSPC process. Uh, this is a little bit of the dynamics of what happens when you print a particular layer. Uh, and so we're optimizing the entire process of printing layers one after another, after another, and after another. So the first step is the build plate, uh, comes down and squishes or squeezes a, a sac, you know, very thin layer of uncured resin. Um, and this is, this is squeezed between the build plate and our membrane in that, in that vat I just mentioned. Then once that is squeezed, we turn on our, our, our LED light, we turn on our call it, call it our light engine. And, you know, depending upon how uniform and how uh, intense that is, that will then cure this material uh, after a, a number of seconds. Um, and so the ability to bring a lot of light through that light engine to that resin is extremely important. Uh, once you've done that, uh, you're, you're now, you basically solidified a, a, a layer of your part between your build plate and your membrane. And you're about to now have to, you have to peel that away to get ready for the next part. But before you do that, right at that boundary of where you have that cured part, uh, you have what we call uh, intermolecular forces. It's not a bond. But that membrane is is in somewhat stuck to that cured part. And the nice thing about our, our technology is that we have what we call a lubricated membrane. So it's a very low energy surface that continuously refreshes its lubrication, which lets you free from those bonds very, very, very easily. And so as we lift our build plate up, our membranes are, are very flexible and resilient. And what you get is you get this initiation of a uh, almost like a peeling of tape effect at the edge of the part which then moves towards the center of the part. And this is a much gentler process uh, and a much faster process than if you're trying to just kind of rip the entire, uh, let's say ripping an entire Band-Aid off versus peeling the Band-Aid away at the edge. Uh, once you've done that, you then wait for the uh, uncured resin to reflow underneath your build plate. And that process happens over and over again. So this is the process that we're optimizing in the LSPC and it's a combination of light engines, motor movements, membrane technology, and all that's what we've uh, engineered into uh, what I'll describe in a few minutes called the Zip Pro. Okay, so uh, before we get there, our holy grail is to, to scale up uh, our, the ability to, to produce lots of parts. And so just real quick, I wanna talk about, you know, can we tr replace traditional manufacturing? If so, where? And what is the state of the play right now in, in that sense? So the first opportunity we have is, is competing against, you know, we always benchmark ourselves against injection molding. Um, 
which is a type of formative manufacturing. And here, uh, as you produce more parts, the parts get cheaper. The reason why they're expensive in the beginning is because you typically have to create a mold to then form that part inside. And so they call that a, a mold or a tool. And those are very expensive if you're just creating a few parts, but as you create many parts, uh, those can be you know very cheap. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, you're you're left with uh, at the at the, at the high number of parts. You're kind of dominated by what your material costs are going to be. Right of manufacturing, we don't really have this concept of a tool. Uh, Add of manufacturing doesn't require tools, which is one of the great aspects of it. Uh, however, uh, at the and then it it scales more flat and more flat based on your operating costs. Um, at some point, because uh, you're 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 walking down this cost curve, at some point. Uh, they cross. And so at Nexa 3D, we've seen use cases where uh, we've seen this crossing for some of our clients at around 10,000 units. So depending on the application, you can get very deep into a number of parts uh, before you have to think about trading off between um, foreign manufacturing. An example of this is Max Res Resolution 3D. This is a service bureau uh, that uses our, our printers over in Germany. Uh, you know, they're, they're exceeding 50,000 parts a month. They have order sizes over a thousand. And what they do is they use, they use our machines in combination with uh, robotic cells to, to really uh, bring down the operating costs and the downstream costs from the process. So that's one opportunity where we, you know, where, where we're trying to, to go after. The second opportunity is time to part, you know, for a formative process or an injection molding process, you typically have to uh, not just design your part, you have to design your two things. You have to design a part and the mold to mold the part into. So you have to go through this extra step uh, of, of making this mold. And that can take one month. You then have to validate your mold uh, through taking test articles. And if that all goes well and you can, you can validate the mold, then you can quickly move into higher levels of production. Uh, if you don't, you have to go through multiple iterations, then that it just compounds. Um, however, for out of manufacturing, because there is no concept of creating a tool, you can start printing right away. Um, you can print right away. Typically, the rates of printing are not as high as very large injection molding, but you see that there's a point where you're better. You're you're you much rather uh, use out of manufacturing. We have, have a really great story with uh, a French service bureau who had to retrofit a thousand police vehicles and the actual whole opportunity was had to be delivered within three months. So because of the time, the only way to capture this actual opportunity was to use 3D printing. So they they uh, were able to meet the, meet the need because the, uh, they could immediately start printing parts and they produced over 18,000 parts. So this is another great example of where uh, 3D printing could replace injection molding. And the last one is this idea of complexity. Uh, as you do formative manufacturing, the more parting lines you have, the more complex your parts are, uh, the higher the cost of that tooling can be. And without a manufacturing, it's this is very flat. There basically complexity is free without a manufacturing. You know, there's some point where it's actually impossible to create something from formative, and and where your only option is is uh, is 3D printing. An example of that we have WeMed, who uh, pioneered this internet connected uh, stethoscope during COVID-19. And this, in this case, it has an internal channel uh, very similar to the, your ear, inner ear, uh, which makes it impossible to actually mold. And so this has to be a product that comes from 3D printing. Uh, this was also produced in the, in the thousands of units. So those are three examples uh, of where we believe that added manufacturing can 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 start to replace traditional manufacturing, and as of course the industry grows, that envelope is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so to 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 do this, you know, what has to be true in the industry to to really truly achieve mass production or replace injection molding? What needs to be true? Uh, first thing is you need very high throughput um, and low total cost of ownership. Uh, what I mean here is. You need to have a lot of parts to be able to produce, be produced on your machine. Uh, and that way, you can think of the capital costs that you outlay as going, to, you know, as approaching zero. So if I'm paying $100,000 for a machine, I'm amortizing that over the number of parts. Eventually, 
uh, that capital expense goes to zero. So you need to basically have high throughput to, to make that be true. And once that's true, then you're dealing with cost of ownership. So you need to have uh, low resin, you know, very, very low material costs. You need to have very low operating costs, very, very low labor inputs. And if you can do all those sorts of things, uh, this will expand the opportunity for, for uh, replacing traditional manufacturing. Of course, you also need to have the part, the, uh, the fit and the finish uh, of the part be analogous to and equivalent to what you would get from um, a traditional formative process. And then finally, you need to uh, also achieve the same uh, uh, functional properties of those other plastics. Uh, in the injection molding space, you know, there's uh, polypropylene may have, you know, a hundred different variants to choose from and, and massive handbooks, plastic engineering handbooks that date back decades. And so as a, at a manufacturing industry, we're, you know, we're, we're a younger industry. And so we need to behave, be have, you know, have access to uh, new materials as they come out and keep on pushing the boundary of what our plastics can do. Uh, to then have a, 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 a replacement product for uh, against uh, um, eject, an injection molding process. So if those things are true, uh, then we can say, yes, we can put this printer into mass manufacturing. So our goal is, you know, we, we've, we've been, been developing out products across this product life cycle. And I just showed you a few slides where the NXE product line has been in to get up into that area of a thousand to, to 10,000 parts and, and we believe this, this, this uh, suspect printer that we'll talk about in a minute uh, can get us beyond that and beyond 10,000 into the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and that's where, that's where our aim is. So we wanna digitize our supply chain and to do that, we need to be able to produce a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, articles. All right, so with that, I have a video which says what I just said, but in two minutes. Traditional manufacturing, difficult to set up, but affordable at scale. Additive manufacturing, easy to set up, but expensive to scale. What if you could have the best of both worlds? Introducing Zip Pro, the first 3D printer engineered specifically for high throughput, high yield manufacturing. With a massive 19.5 liter build volume and a print speed up to 24 vertical centimeters per hour, you can print full builds in under two hours or thousands of parts in just one day, all powered by patented LSPC technology. With Zip Pro's powerful new light engine and proprietary self-lubricating membrane, you don't have to compromise between speed and part quality. With over 30 validated materials, including production resins like X-Peak, X-Ceramic, and X-ABS, your printed parts look, feel, and perform just like injection molded parts. And with an open material platform, the possibilities are endless. Whether you need one part or 1,000 parts, Zip Pro's productivity is unmatched. Already the most affordable solution in its class, Zip Pro's industry-leading throughput allows you to do more with less. One Zip Pro can produce the same output as four of the next fastest industrial 3D printers. And with the ability to produce parts on demand, rather than holding expensive inventories, you can put your capital back to work. This is productivity redefined. This is Zip Pro. All right, I caught myself dancing there a little bit, so I'll, I'll settle back down. Uh, so that's a Zip Pro uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Uh, video is fantastic, but I can really truly say that this is a, a, a industry industry leading product. Uh, it it I, it has industry leading throughput. I'll talk about. I'll give an example of that in a minute. Uh, it has the largest build volume in its class, highest resolution in its class, and its lowest TCO in this class. I've never. Had a product before I could say this about, but this is truly the, you know an, an amazing testament to what our engineers have been able to do uh, in building this product. Uh, we've we've imbued this with a very intelligent print process. I'll talk about some of that in a, in, a, in a few minutes. And of course, we have over thirty validated materials. I mentioned we need to obviously keep on expanding on that. Uh, and in addition to that, we are an open material platform. So uh, beyond the materials that we validate with our partners, we also 
uh, believe in openness um, at Nexa 3D. And this is in fact an open platform. So if there's an idea out there you have or a resin that we don't have um, and it will work, this is, the, this is the platform for you. Okay, you know, it'd be remiss to not show some tech specs. Um, so everyone can, can take a look at this. Uh, the bill volume is, is 19.5 liters, depending if you're in the metric system or the English system. Uh, you can see the, the, the actual build dimension sizes. Uh, I'm in the English system, so I think of this as a, what I help, I say 11 by six by 16. So um, 11 by six by 16, all the same numbers from an inches perspective. Um, and that corresponds to 29 centimeters by 16 centimeters by 41 centimeters in the metric system. We'll talk a little bit about the design in the next few slides. Uh, it has a an LCD screen, as I mentioned, for, for uh, uh, carving out those pixels. Uh, I'll, we'll have a slide talking about that later, but just to give you an idea at a glance of what we're, what we're looking at here. Okay, so uh, a few things we're gonna talk about. First being unparalleled productivity. I mentioned you need to have lots of throughput uh, to be able to one, meet the demands of your clients, but two, also uh, reduce your overall cost per part. And uh, we have uh, a very large build volume and speeds that are industry leading speeds. And what this really means is if you were to multiply out our build area advantage and our speed advantage, uh, you'll find that the Zip Pro uh, in certain cases would be four times the throughput of, of our, nearest, uh, our nearest competitor. Uh, as an example of that, uh, we took a head-to-head -head benchmark against a Origin 1 part uh, taken from their ROI calculator and then compared a similar part uh, with the similar dimensions and the similar part volume and the same uh, material from BASF and looked at how fast we'd be able to print that one. Um, so for a similar build, uh, we would be able to build uh, this uh, a full array of parts in an hour and 36 minutes on that build plate would be 66 parts. Uh, compared to a two hour and 53 minutes build from uh, an origin one machine with 28 parts per build. And so when you multiply this out and look at it from a parts per day perspective, uh, the Zip Pro will, will be able to punch out over 700 parts uh, compared to around 170 parts for the origin one. And if you divide them out, this is about a 4.5 times improvement in throughput. Uh, so just a, an example of, of one scenario uh, where, where we can bear out that, that 4X uh, claim. All right, next one is obviously if you're gonna approach uh, injection molding type products, you need to have uh, an amazing accuracy and amazing surface finish. Uh, and so what really provides this is that 7K uh, LCD screen. A uh, few things here, each pixel, this is, this is you know, when you multiply this out, there's 23 million pixels in this LCD. Each, each one is 46 uh, microns on the side. You can even do uh, image-based uh, processing on the edges of your, of, your, of, your, of your layers to create what we call anti-aliasing or sub-pixel resolution. So you're able to get down to, you know, accuracies uh, less than a human hair, or less than half a human hair, uh, with this with this uh, level of detail. Um, the other really thing I really appreciate is the LCD is sitting right below where you have your resin. So what when it comes to any aberration or just you know or or stray light, you're having a lot of what I call pixel sharpness because you're curing the the resin right at the place where you're forming your 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 pixel. Um, so that gives you the sharpest features you can possibly imagine. Uh, so this is an example of of a of that uh, you saw that in the video. This is this um, uh, air intake uh, part or manifold, and you can just see in this blown up image how smooth the surface is and the luster you you see on the part, um, demonstrating that the surface finish is extremely smooth. And then uh, another part, and lastly, we we spent a lot of time on here is the idea of you need to have a smarter printer. You know, when you move into production, you may be doing distributed production or you may be doing uh, a batch one week and then moving and doing another type of part and coming back to that a week later. In each case, you wanna make sure that the printer and the starting points 
is doing the same thing each time. So we have a number of things here to help the user make sure that they 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 get the same part out every time. On the left, uh, I mentioned that uh, there's only one access in this printer, so we're going to make sure that that access is as smart as possible. So we have a lot of strategies around how we move conduct our motor movements based on the geometry that we're trying to print. Uh, and we also have some great features around uh, smart uh, debris detection. So if the printer goes to print and if it finds something, uh, a, a part that uh, maybe broke off or a piece, something in the bottom of the vat, as small as one millimeter, it will abort the print and tell you that there's something not ready to be printed. And then you can go ahead and make that change and get, get back running. Um, on the right, we've added what we call the weather station to, to the Zipro. <clears throat> and this, what it does is it tracks the environmental conditions uh, that it, that is within the chamber itself, including resin temperature, chamber temperature, humidity, any stray ambient UV. And uh, these, this is the idea here is that you want to make sure that every time you print your part, you're starting from the same starting point and that you know that you're following a coherent process. Okay, uh, I'm going to show another video. Uh, one of the things that we've, there's a, what's nice about having an industrial line and a desktop line is there's this, this conversation that happens between the, the two products. And so the, the Zip Pro really takes the best of, of what we've seen in the NXE product and the best in the Zip product. And uh, one of the great ideas we had in the Zip product was this uh, removable VAT system and, re and removable membrane system. So we brought that over to the, to the Zip Pro and I'll show you what that looks like. Flip the vat upside down and place it on a clean and level work surface. Place the membrane on the bottom of the vat with the gasket facing downwards. Once the membrane is in place, flip up the four inner clamps and rest the edge inside the groove. Carefully pull all four outer clamps downward, ensuring that the inner clamp continues to rest within the gasket grooves. Flip the vat right side up and place the resin spout on the back right hand corner, pressing down to snap on and attach. Lastly, lower the resin vat assembly onto the LCD. The magnetic clamps will lock in place automatically and can be unlocked through the menu. All right, so this is a, a piece of the Zip product line that we brought over to the Zip Pro. And literally, it's that easy to switch out materials. Uh, with this printer, if you're in a service bureau environment or you're in a high mix environment, we want you to have the ability to quickly swap out materials and not have to have a lot of material committed to a particular printer. Uh, so we have this great VAT system, very simple to swap out. And when you're not printing a particular resin, you can put it on the shelf and develop a library and, and not waste any materials. Okay. And then I think the last thing I want to talk about is, is just the overall construction of the Zip Pro. It is made from a aluminum billet. Um, the idea here is that you, similar to machine tools, you need a very solid, rigid body from which you're printing. Um, if you're trying to capture resolutions of a screen which can print down to a half a hair uh, in size, you need to basically be able to return your, your build plate and your part to that same degree. Otherwise, you're just washing out that resolution and it's, and it's, it's all for naught. So having this really rigid well uh, engineered and well well driven enclosure is going to give you that precision. Um, we've we've had a very rugged Z axis. Again, that's the one we have in the printer. So let's make sure that we 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 put our our all into it. And also we have an onboard computer uh, with lots of ample space for for future opportunity for upgrades. Um, and you know, as you know, every you know, software is a huge component of, of, of any piece of equipment now, and, and we will always be updating and, and developing new feature sets. From a reliability and serviceability perspective, this is probably our most, our most serviceable uh, reliability. I, we believe it's going to be very reliable, but that time will tell. A serviceable printer. Um, the nice thing about it is you don't need a special wrench to go remove your, your oil filter. Uh, everything can be accessible from uh, hand accessible repair points. And many of the items in this are meant to be consumer replaceable. Uh, so if you have some downtime, you, you don't have to rely on a service visit or scheduling always a service visit in every case. But it means we have partners who will do that. Um, but 
we have designed it so that the user can 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 dictate as much uptime as possible. Okay, so materials we uh, are feverishly validating our materials. We have roughly twenty or so already validated, and then we'll bring the portfolio up to that thirty plus within the next few months. Uh, I just highlighted a few here: the X ceramic material that is our fastest material. It prints up to twenty four centimeters an hour. And on the functional side, our new uh, our new acquisition of, of Abatafab is bringing us. Uh, they are their thin material, uh, free form injection molding material, which Glenn is going to talk about later in the call. I mentioned apart from the validate materials, we also have open library. So this is where you can bring in your own resins or third party resins, and it allows you to pro you know customize the process as well as customize the supports uh, that you use for that particular resin. All right, so the workflow, uh, prepare, print, wash, cure, and finish. Those are the, the five steps that you would undertake to get your parts out the door. Uh, for preparing, we have a software called Nexa X. Uh, this is our, our print preparation software. It has a few features to, it allows you to, be, to get your parts ready for the printer. And it also has a fleet management uh, component where if you have multiple printers on the on the on, in the in your fleet, you can manage prints and look at statuses across all of them. Uh, I have a few bullets here. Uh, we have a number of advanced orientation algorithms, customizable supports, and other things that are really in, intended to get the most out of the printer. Not just trying to print one part, but be able to let you scale up and print many parts. Um, some other really great things about this product is. You can do things like, like this, where you can actually uh, create different support strategies uh, for every part in your build. So if you're, you know, the idea here is you, you want to print as many parts as possible, but you also want to learn as much as possible. Uh, so if you were to do something like this, where you, you know, you go with your default support settings for one part, um, impossibly minimal supports for another part, make the print, see what happens, and then you, you can quickly hone in and to that to that support strategy, uh, which is going to maximize your print success, but then also minimize your, your downstream uh, post-processing steps. So printing, uh, I talked about all the specs from a, from a printability and using the machine perspective, uh, there are a lot of really great uh, creature comforts in the printer. There are print compat compatibility checks, making sure that what's in the vat matches what's in the cartridge, matches what's in the file you send to the printer. Uh, we have a very smart gravity-fed uh, dispense system that quite, it's all hands-off, doesn't require any human intervention. Uh, we showed the electromagnetic magnetic VAT attachment, and all of this is toolless, so you don't need any specific tools just to, to change out your resins. Um, we mentioned the environmentals, uh, I mentioned the smart homing, and of course, the whole thing is, is meant to be very easy to, to manage. Okay, once you're done your part, once you're done printing your part, you will have uh, some small sacrificial amount of, of, of uncured resin uh, clinging to your parts. And so that has to be washed off with the solvent. Uh, we have an industrial size washer uh, that comes alongside the Zip Pro. And this uses our, our, our solvent called X-Clean, which has a much higher level of uh, solubility uh, than say IPA. So you can remove IPA from this, from this workflow. Uh, and and get very far, you know, have a, a washing system that goes as fast as your as your printing system. Curing, uh, most resins need curing to meet the final validated specs from our from our from our, our resin partners. So uh, they give us a full recipe to ensure that the part comes out with the right material properties. And so our curing system called the X Cure uh, has multiple wavelengths, has a heater to to uh, maximize the the properties. And that also is industrial size to keep a pace with your Zip Pro. After you've done all of your printing and your curing and, and your washing, uh, then you also may have to do some finishing where you might be removing supports, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we find that the folks that do the, 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 the best or, or, or approach the highest number of, of parts uh, always are very smart in how they design their part and how they design their builds to minimize uh, what ultimately would be their, their finishing steps. Okay, so that is it. That, that covers everything. 
Um, I want to make sure we go quick enough to have time at the end for questions. And the product is shipping now. It comes with all those components you see in the picture. And in fact, you know, we even shipped our first printer before we even announced our printer. So this is uh, in stock, the Zip Pro is in stock and ready to be shipped immediately. Okay, uh, with that uh, service plan, so we call our service plans the Evercare plan. And what we do here is uh, our Evercare plan, you can uh, cover the printer to up to three years. And our plan is a, is a white glove a service and warranty plan. Uh, so that includes installation, it includes troubleshooting and support, and really great thing, it includes a, an annual scheduled maintenance program. We've heard a lot of, of, of uh, feedback that people really like this bumper to bumper uh, types of programs for their industrial products. And so we've, we've extended uh, the Evercare program into that space. All right, so the product portfolio uh, on the photopolymer side, we've got the Zip Pro. And it is our, our, our latest flagship product. And then we also have our NXE Pro and we have our Zip. Um, and just a bit of a, a quick comparison there. Uh, up until about two weeks ago, the NXE Pro was our flagship product. And uh, by all means, still had all those, even ha had throughput advantages even then. So we're going to continue with, with both the Zip Pro and the NXE Pro line into the future. Um, and so you should expect that uh, both these systems will be will be available and are available today currently. All right, I want to uh, set up uh, set up Glenn from Wilson very quickly with this just the slide. I talked about the three opportunities earlier, and there's a fourth opportunity which we haven't talked about yet. And this is instead of trying to replace um, you know formative manufacturing or injection molding straight up which we believe we, we, we can be able to do with the Zip Pro. There's a fourth opportunity, and this opportunity is to actually uh, augment the formative process by using additive, additive, manufacturer, additive manufacturing tools like the Zip Pro to reduce the cost of tooling. Um, and so by doing that, you can actually flatten the cost per part curve. You can move in the uh, time to part curve, and you can actually also flatten the uh, part complexity curve uh, by using soft tooling or additive uh, AM tooling in conjunction. And so with that, I'll, I'll pass it off to Glenn and he can describe how this, how they're using this uh, opportunity number four at Wilson. Hi there, that was a great slide, Michael. Thank you for that. Um, I'm Glenn Mason. I've been at Wilson Sporting Goods. I'm working with them for 30 years injection molding. So it's been uh, quite a run for me. Um, I did start early, so I feel like I've got a lot of years ahead of me. And what I'm most excited about here is the additive tooling component that is also enabled with the Zip Pro printer. So I see a lot of challenges in uh, what I'm doing from an injection molding perspective. Even though we go art to part in our building, we have the opportunity to uh, build as many tools as we would like uh, well, we have constrained resources, and what we find is that uh, there's a, at scale, if you know what you want, injection molding solves a lot of problems, but often in the R&D space, we don't know what we're looking for, and we need to hunt for a solution, and often that means we're looking at innovative ways to bring the cost and the time to build tools down. Uh, when we came across the freeform injection molding process, I was a little skeptical initially because I come from a traditional workflow. We did some benchmarking and instantly I realized this is a disruptive technology. It's gonna be changing the future of injection molding. So I'm really excited to share that with you, talk about our specific applications. You can see here on the slide, we did a handle for a baseball bat. Uh, this is beyond just a conceptual prototype. It's actually a part that's been molded in a fiber reinforced injection molded material. So I have a very complex shape. I have a uh, interpenetrating fiber network. It's not layered. It's the equivalent of any injection molded part that I would make with a metal mold. We just did it in a day and uh, a few molding cycles to get to a prototype instead of weeks and weeks and weeks of machining and uh, eventually uh, final testing. Can you switch to the next slide? Oh, this is great. Uh, so, 
I put this together to kind of describe uh, kind of where I see the, the, the landscape of this uh, injection mold application. And uh, people are really struggling. Uh, the bat slide that we just showed uh, came out of a, a supply chain constraint that everybody's familiar with now. And we were trying to figure out, okay, how can we get to a spot where we're able to make um, better decisions faster um, and kind of de-risk where we see things that we were doing more traditionally. And so it was difficult to do that in a metal format to say, well, let's take our resources that are aligned to keep our production line moving and start iterating to, to basically solve problems that we didn't know we were going to have or, or things that we thought we solved with our existing supply chain that were no longer available. And so this chart kind of illustrates how I see the the world of, of, of a traditional formative um, manufacturing processes. So the cost to fail is generally very high and the time to fail is generally very long uh, with the traditional manufacturing process. Lots of toolings involved, lots of process developments involved. And as soon as there's a uh, unforeseen change, lack of material, uh, machine failure, then be, there's just no opportunity. And so you're, there's a lot of risk built into the system that we try to manage as well as possible. So if I can bring down the cost to fail and I can bring down the time to fail, what I'm really doing is de-risking the future. I'm able to change faster. And the technology that I use to uh, get to a, a prototype is also the same technology that we're gonna use to get to a a what if scenario, a next better thing. So instead of just saying, we know what we want, we need to get there fast, that's great. But the exact same technology says, what if I don't know what I want? Or if I want to try this five different times, you know, Mike alluded to that support generation tool saying, what is the real best way to make this? And often we see in a, a traditional process, we design what we think is the best, but we've never made the specific part before. So we end up with a uh, basically a problem that we fight forever. So this allows me to iterate even on parts I already know how to make so I can improve the existing product line as well. Do you wanna to switch to the next slide? Uh, this is a great uh, example of, of the, not just looking at the specific product, but looking at the process that gets me to that product. So uh, often there is a uh, expert involved. I might be guilty of that often and where we have lots of ideas and they get funneled down through someone who has to do a lot of um, design inputs, right? So we're trusting them to make a lot of high level decisions, even on products that we don't really have all the information we'd like to have. So what that translates to is only a few ideas make it through the system. And they take a while because they have to go through these skilled workflows, usually humans. So ideally what we would do is test all the ideas, uh, test them all quickly, and then really be informed by that empirical testing, not just what we think is the best idea or we're looking at the past, say, let's just test the future. Let's open up the, the floodgates so all the ideas can happen at a really low cost. They can all happen really fast and then we can vet them against each other really easily. So uh, the graphic here just kind of illustrates that. And I think you know, I've, I've, that I can, I, I can get four times as many things done in less time so the value here is just absolutely exponential. And we are democratizing the process. So we don't have to go through an expert. We can, we can bypass that process because the tooling is temporary. It's digital, it's fast. And the cost to testing one more new thing is very low. You wanna to go to the next slide? Oh, this is my, my wrap up here. So I'll let you read that, but um, the, the theme here that I'm trying to, to illustrate uh, and why I'm ex so excited to collaborate with Nexa is because this is a win for everybody. It's better for me as an R&D designer. It's better for our manufacturing team. It's better for our customers. Being less expensive, faster, and really with a much, much larger build capacity than our legacy DLP systems, there is really an an untapped potential here that we're unlocking. And I'm just truly excited to be participating in this process and I'm happy to answer any questions at any time.
All right, thanks so much, Glenn. Um, if, if I may, I'll start off a question uh, specifically for you, and that, that is uh, going through the beta testing process with the Zip Pro, what were some standouts for you um, interacting with that uh, platform? Well, the Zip Pro is really, I think Mike alluded to this before, kind of the best of industrial and the best of desktop combined, where the you know unboxing setup, it's basically plug and play. Uh, super easy to use. Um, it's very intuitive. There's not a lot of challenges around, you know, how do I set this up? How do I step through the workflow? Uh, I was just really impressed with the whole process, uh, the membrane changing. If, if you've ever had to do that on a legacy system, you'll instantly realize how much better this design is. Um, and it enabled us to, in, in the beta testing to really um, discover even new ways we're going to use this printer beyond just a specific mold application because the changeover is easy. I don't have to be stuck with just one resin. I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, awesome. Great feedback, Glenn. And what specifically... Um... Did you notice any differences in uh, part quality or print speed or anything that kind of felt like it was turning some wheels in your head and you thought about maybe new ways you might utilize uh, the printer as well? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. In fact, that's already happened. So um, larger in a legacy system usually meant lower resolution. And here I get both. I get a much larger print format, much finer resolution. And initially my focus was, how do I get molds? How do I get molds? How do I get molds? And as soon as we saw the, the scale of the build uh, platform, we realized, oh, we could start building parts here as well. So we did some initial testing and some alternate non-mold materials and realized that the same tool I want to use in my R&D team to iterate on tooling, I'm also gonna be using to iterate on parts. So that, that flexibility and the, the part quality coming out of the system is fantastic. Awesome, thank you for sharing. All right, we'll open it up for questions. We've got quite a few coming in. Uh, Mike, do you mind uh, hopping back on and sharing your camera? Oh, hello. All righty. Uh, so we're going to go through a couple of questions here. The first one, I think this is a great one and always a, a great clarifying point as well, specifically about our technology. Um, but with a, the membrane in the resin vat, um, have we experienced issues with the top membrane creasing due to peel forces? Is there a concern peel forces will tear the top of uh, the membrane? Yep, so the I would say that... Uh... The, the membranes, the, the, the LSPC process is that uh, we have a, a lubricated layer on both the, the top and the bottom. So the idea there is that it is going to not bind as strongly or, or, or connect as, as strongly to the, the cured layer. And the, the objective with that is then to, to, to prevent you know, tears or, or, or creases um, by allowing that uh, separation to happen with lower force. Um, have we seen tears? Sure. You, you know, if you were to make a cup, for instance, where the actual force on the membrane is not the force of the, of the, the connection, but actually the force of a vacuum you're creating, uh, then you're putting a, you know, an extrinsic force on the membrane that, you know, we, you know, we didn't expect and which we try to then tell you that, Hey, that's a situation or a geometry, um, that you should be avoided. Um, so that's that's, that's great, how it answers that question. Point, Mike, you actually have cupping detection built into the software, right? Correct. Awesome. Yep. All right. Uh, next question here. Um, this one's digging a little bit. In, oh, actually, this is a great question. Uh, is the net uh, network connection something that can be local or is it cloud-based? Um, this particular user is an ITAR facility and they want to know if they can keep everything within their intranet. Yeah, so the the printer can be run um, in a few different modes. It, it doesn't need to be connected to any network. You can use a USB so you can bring files to it and just print there. Uh, you also can connect it to a internal network if you want to send files from your next X software to the machine, but you can still pin that to, you know, an internal network. Uh, it doesn't have um, the need to connect out to the, the greater, uh, the greater internet. 
if, uh, to, to address the ITAR issue. Yeah, it makes uh, complete sense there. Uh, and then another technical spec question on the printer, they were curious about the wavelength. Yep, so our curing uh, LEDs are a, a 405 uh, nanometer wavelength light. Okay. Yep, those are easy questions. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> no, no, they, they, there is a long list coming through. Thank you to all of our attendees <laughs> for, uh, for submitting these. Um, can uh, another user asked, uh, can they uh, get a list of service providers who offer Nexus uh, LSPC technology? Yeah, you, you definitely can. Um, we also have that available on our website. So you'll see uh, in the in the footer of our website, you'll see uh, find a reseller link, and that should give you, uh, you know, some quick quick access to to finding that out. If not, you know, we can take your name offline and and send you a list. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're happy to follow up with that one. All right, um, Glenn, this is a great question for uh, the uh, reform injection molding process. How do you compare that to other 3D printing rapid tooling technologies, um, particularly any sort of standout advantages for you? Well, quickly, I know we don't have a ton of time. I'm just going to say that if you look at um, rapid tooling, um, the mold still has to open and that's the fundamental challenge because you get adhesion and things like that uh, but more importantly you have to design the mold and you have to design the part to be molded um, with the freeform process it's a single use tool it's dissolvable and so you can really jump forward from just part design to molding parts and that really enables uh, a lot of things when you take out ejection cooling undercut management, things like that, the mold becomes trivial. And of course, with the Zip Pro, the print time is just, you know, minutes, hours at the most. So um, the workflows significantly improve because the material is uh, dissolvable. Okay. Um, and then uh, going back to some materials related questions really quickly, uh, Mike, when cleaning the tray, um, does that affect the lubrication on the membrane? Great question. Um, so the, the you don't have to clean the tray. So you can you can uh, use additional vats if you like. Uh, if you do want to trade off and move between uh, materials, uh, you can. We we, we, we give you a set of squeegees um, to then remove as much resin as you can from the membrane, uh, and then at that point. Uh, we you use a, a small amount of IPA and and gently wipe uh, you know the 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 membrane. Yeah. What I would say is you don't want to like abrade or try to like scour the membrane. You want to you want to leave as much of that lubrication there as possible. So you do that by by being very gentle, uh, you know, gentle with the membrane. I would say just as an example that the case I I told you about the the French police cars they used two membranes. And 330 liters of, of resin. Uh, so the the if handled properly, these membranes can can last hundreds of, of liters of resin of printing. Great. And just to kind of expand on that a little bit, um, so because I know sometimes uh, terminology can get a bit mixed up. So if, if you mean the the full vat, certainly the vat is billet aluminum, really easy to clean, and it uh, comes with a pour spout to pour out excess resin. Um, before you do that, we actually have a clean cycle as well uh, that you can run in the maintenance portion of the interface. And that essentially creates a cured layer to the full bot uh, bottom portion of uh, the membrane that can then easily be uh, peeled up to remove um, any debris that might be uh, in the in the vat if, if possible. So um, just want to point that out there. Um, great question here as we are wrapping up. Um, they said, uh, what's the best way to purchase one? All right. Well, the, the best way to purchase one is we we sell our industrial equipment and all of our equipment through a, a set of resellers, and those vary by by geography. So, uh, the best way to do it would be go to our website, um, conduct your research, make sure you you understand what's going on, and then uh, again in that footer there'll be a, a, a find a reseller link, or you can then go see you know who in your area um, is a is an authorized reseller, and then they'll be able to then take you further and demo, look at benchmarking, et cetera, et cetera. 
Awesome, thank you. We're gonna end on, on one question here that I think is a great part of all of our technologies. Um, before I get to that question, I did wanna tell our audience, I know we had a lot of questions coming in here towards the end. So if we did not answer your question today, we'll be sure to follow up individually um, and include some FAQs uh, after the fact so that uh, everyone can get the answers to the questions that have been presented today. Um, so uh, we'll wrap up the last question here, specifically about the open mode functionality of the Zip Pro. Um, what level of control is provided in the open mode? And specifically, can you adjust exposure time or intensity um, for each layer? Yep. Uh, all those things you mentioned are, are definitely controllable. Uh, what the, the tools we give you are in fact the exact same set of tools that our internal process team has at their uh, behest to actually validate materials. So everything that we use internally to validate is, is exposed to you um, for your own development. So everything we can is the, is the short answer. <laughs> awesome. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We really greatly appreciate your attendance and your time. Um, we are very excited about this new product, so don't hesitate to reach out um, if you have any questions uh, regarding uh, your specific application and how it might work with our printer or any technical specs. Um, we are happy to help. Um, thank you so much for joining. Glenn, thank you so much for sharing some words of wisdom with us as well. Um, and uh, happy Thursday, everyone. <laughs>